We're going to get there. And I'm going to tell you what the word is because I believe it is extremely timely. This is a really good word, a prophetic word. And it's a word of hope, a word of God's grace and mercy. I love even, uh, John, when you're leading in worship and talking about the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance. God's not willing that any would perish, but that all would repent. God is so loving and caring. We sing amazing grace, and God's reaching out his hand, and he's lifting us. I was thinking of the hymn, Love Lifted Me. Love did lift me. I can remember singing that hymn after I first got saved. I was sinking deep in sin, far from a peaceful shore. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and in love, he lifted me. And I believe God wants to lift people today and wants us to be lifters of people today and enable God to pour out of his spirit. And, and I thought of those words, you know, God's hand is upon us. He never lets go of us. He's just uh, looking after us. And uh, oftentimes when we look at Scripture, uh, we look at Scripture just as if it's like forever ago. And I wish I could take some of what I'm going to say today and put it in the first person and say, last night you wouldn't believe what happened. <laughs> I'd like to speak it in first person as if it happened to me. But I'm thankful what I'm going to share didn't happen in my life last night. Because it's quite a story. We're going to pick it up in Luke 17. And when we say we're going to pick it up, it isn't the actual story, but what Jesus had to say about this story. And often hear people say, well, yeah, that's Old Testament. As a pastor, somebody will say, that's Old Testament. Well, yeah, it is Old Testament. And then there's New Testament. The Old Testament and the New Testament are still working together. The old is a new contained. The new is the old explained. So we're going to get both Testaments in here, and somebody say, well, yeah, that's an Old Testament. We have the Old Testament for our examples, that we can see what God has done and what he's continually doing. God's moving, and we want to just look to both Old and New. And Jesus is speaking here in Luke 17, and let's pick it up in the 26th verse. 26th verse, where he says, and as it was... In the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. The flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat. They drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. What he's saying here is life went on as usual in both cases. Now, remember, Lot was respected least by those who knew him best. Noah was respected most by those who knew him best. That same day, Verse 29, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which is shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field let him likewise not return back. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. If you're looking to memorize a scripture for a little treat after church today, that would be a good one. Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Pretty short verse, but Jesus said do it. Remember her. Now, we're going to be looking back at Genesis chapter 19. We're going to go back to Last night at Sodom. Last night in Sodom, you wouldn't believe what happened from Lot's perspective. When you think of Lot, you think of somebody who's in the wrong place, but he sure stayed there a long time. And it did impact and affect him. And I want us to see the difference. I think we're living in a culture, in an environment where the wheels of perverted civilization have just uh, fallen off, 
you know, the car, I can remember just going to Des Moines and seeing a car uh, wheel going down the divided highway over by Fairfield, and all I saw was a wheel. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. But then the wheel started to veer off and come to the median and then come into my lane, and I just, just avoided hitting it, kept going, and then I saw the car without the wheel pulled over to the side of the road. The front wheel had come off. Hey, all the wheels have come off the car in our nation. We're, we're, we're just in a real, really uh, perverted civilization. And um, I'm glad I wasn't there in Sodom's day. I'm glad that I wasn't in that position. And uh, we're not just speaking about Sodom in uh, that place, but all of the things that happened. Let's pick it up in the 19th chapter. Now, 1915 is not the verse that I got, but this is kind of where we're going to spring off of today. And this is what I want you to look for. When the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot. We don't use that word often, but hastened. It's a revival word or a word of prodding. It's a word of going forth. It's a word of saying we're not staying complacent, but the angels of the Lord were specifically directed by the Lord to hasten Lot. They were going to get him off center. They were, come on, come on, you lingered long enough. And today I want to close the service to say, really, I want you to be hastened. I want to be hastened. I want to be quickened. I want to be pushed into what God has next for us because the complacency has settled over our nation. It's huge. And so we're going to pick it up, at Genesis 19. Let's just pick the first verse. We'll read quite a bit of scripture here, but it's well worth laying a foundation. For those who are unfamiliar with the story, Abraham has just interceded for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, we're seeing the angels are going to enter into Sodom. So there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot, seeing them, rose to meet them, bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray thee, into your servant's house. Tarry all night and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. Go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him him. And it into his house, and he made them a feast. They did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And just for those of us who are wanting the difference between King James and modern translation, that we may have sex with them, is what they're saying. It was kind of... And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him, like, hey, hold on, and said, I pray thee, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters, which I have not known, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the roof, uh, the shadow of my roof. And they said to him, stand back. They said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worth, worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now I don't know how you view this, but this is extremely aggressive behavior. This is aggressive. But the men, the angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. 
And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, spake to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. That's where I want you to underline that. The, the angels of the Lord hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest they be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and sent him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. No kidding. And thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now the city is near to flee unto. It's a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. It is not a little one. My soul shall live. And he said unto them, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything Tell thou have come thither. I can't do anything. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. The Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, Mrs. Lot, looked back. From behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where the Lord stood before the Lord. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities, the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. I want you to think about that long and hard. Abraham's intercession had a huge part in this. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, the Bible says, we persuade men. We're persuasive, and we need to be persuasive. The angels that morning had this hastening, and that is to, to move it. Come on, come on, come on. Lot, you're lingering. Lot, you're dragging your feet, waddling here. You're, you're too slow. We, we've got to make this happen because it's going to happen quickly. Now, this word is the word that I got. And it's out of the Amplified, and I want you to listen to it very carefully. Hebrews 2, 16. That's the word I can't get out of my mind when we are reading together. For as we all know, he, Christ, did not take hold of angels, the fallen angels, to give them a helping and delivering hand. But he did take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham to reach out to them a helping and delivering hand. 
But that word just, just stuck within me. He didn't reach out to the fallen angels, but he did. Reach out to the fallen descendants of Abraham, giving them a delivering, delivering, a helping and delivering hand. I want that just to really sink in you really, really deep. Because in 2 Peter, it says here, he delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them. He became desensitized. I have heard people say, well, you should watch this movie. I said, is it good? It's good. Is it clean? It's clean. You watch it, you're like, maybe, maybe, maybe not as clean as maybe they thought it was. Because our culture has desensitized us. Some of the people in our church don't have a TV. For those of us who do, and you listen to the main or you've seen any uh, commercials, we're being desensitized right now. They're showing us glimpses of things on insurance, on uh, at bank, on anything and everything Hollywood's putting out. They're making sure that you're desensitized in certain areas because they want you to think this is normal in God's sense of perversion. It's wickedness. But they want you to think like they think because Sodom said, we're going to just continue on like we always have been. But there will come a day. And there is a day coming. And I believe God is bringing in, they're, they're coming toward us, those people who can help us, even angels, to say, it's time for us to take heed and to be hastened. That's a word for revival, is to be hastened, to be moved, to say, now is the time, if ever there was a time, for us to get out. Lot did not get out on his own. Lot is persuaded. He is persuaded to leave Sodom. Here's what it said. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing, that's the eye gate, in hearing, that's the ear gate, Vex his righteous soul from day to day with her unlawful deeds. I've seen and heard things I'd rather not see or hear. I've seen and heard things even on the news through all of this uh, demonstrations and peaceful my foot. They're not peaceful. There's some garbage being spewed out. Dishonor, dishonor, dishonor. I'm going to tell you, it's filth right from the pit of hell you got to be careful you don't repeat any of that filth. I mean, it's just like coming right through the main things here. Now, we're in this world, but this world is not our home. We're passing through. We're just on, we're, we're all going through. We're, we're, we're kind of like pilgrims passing through. Lot, uh, you know, he chose to pitch his tent uh, here, you know, in that place. New Testament, and I love this, David Wilkerson said this years ago, The New Testament is all about getting Sodom out of you. The Old Testament is about getting Lot out of Sodom. But they're both kind of, you know, similar. We're not in Sodom, but boy, it sure looks like we're getting a whole lot close to something very similar like it. He looked it over and he said, I I like it. It looks good. He chose it, so he moved there. And then he journeyed. And when he got there, he set up his tent and pitched it that way. And Lot received supernatural deliverance from Sodom. He lingered there way too long. Now, we're in the world. We're not of the world. Uh, therefore, you know, we got to just say, hey, there's a, a warning that's been given. And he says, get out of there quickly. You know, that's what's happening. A lot did get out of Sodom. And, uh, you know, there's a reason for that. Now, Sodom had no Bible. And I think it's important for us to say we have a Bible. And that's why we really need to take heed to it. Sodom didn't have a Bible, but we do. I think Leonard Raven held a great revivalist to preach that message. You are in this world. You're not of this world. D.L. Moody said this concerning Lot. The life of Lot, as a subject, he's a representative man. Where there are one Abraham, one Daniel, one Elijah, there are a thousand Lots. Nothing special here. Wow, that's pretty profound when you think about it. God's looking for men and women who rise above. Rise above. Lot got entangled. Lot's wife got engulfed. She was entertained. She was enthralled, engulfed. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. There's a fine line here. 
You know, Sodom moved into her. They moved into Sodom. Sodom moved into her. But Sodom moved into the whole family. And there's a fine line between wife's, Lot's wife looking back and Lot's hesitation. It's just a matter of time. And you need to really get that. Three things sin will always do. We've mentioned this before, but we need to remind ourselves. Sin will always take you farther than you wanted to go. You're thinking you're going to do moderation. You're in for a longer haul. It will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Always. You thought you were only going to just check out the trailer. You thought you were only going to be in it until it, no, you're in. Like you just stay in. You're in. You get like sucked in. It's, it's like a vacuum. It will always cost you more than you were willing to pay. You don't see the price tag, but there's more. And you will pay. Sin is incredibly deceptive. Psalm 1 tells us it's a predictable pattern. The pattern is huge. You get casual contact or ungodly counsel. You're walking where you shouldn't walk. Listening to what you shouldn't listen. Seeing what you shouldn't see. Willful association. You, you get in the sinner's way, you start standing. Instead of walking, you stand to think, well, maybe I need to listen to this for a little longer. And then there's deliberate involvement. You sit. You're sitting in the seat of a scorner, the scornful seat. This nation's full of scorners. Scorning you, scorning me, scorning God, scorning his word. Scorn, 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 scorn. You don't need that in you. You're not going to be blessed by following that. You know, you could end up shorn and powerless like Samson who went another step and laid in the lap of Delilah. Delilah, oh, flirting with Delilah, was flirting with the devil. And the devil brought old Samson down because Samson wasn't big bicep boy. He wasn't somebody who was, you know, Hercules. He was a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the devil said, we're going to get him, and I know how to get him. The devil knows your weakness. He sets up satanic setups. They're based on observation of your life. It's different for everybody. And he set Samson up, and Samson took the bait and fell. He not only had what we call the, 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 the binding, he had the blinding and then the grinding. He ground about a will. He just never got anywhere then until he crowded upon the Lord to touch him again. We call this kind of the, the lust leads to a must, and then it's just plain disgust. Make a great poem. A lot of rhyming words there. People who lust... It's a must. You've got to have it. And then eventually they're disgusted by how this has taken hold. Those of us who've had any addiction, we know exactly what that means. And I know that God can do and set people free, but there's, there's that looking at this and saying, here's the difference. Now, there's a difference between divine revelation here and human reasoning. Believers in many camps or in many churches, as a believer, we can all be there where we forget and stop, start losing hearing God and we start depending upon what we've done in the past. Yeah, it's worked before, it'll work again. So human reasoning. God wants and delights to speak to his church a fresh word, a rhema word, a now word, a word of activity. Think of the words of men. Lot said, Lot said, hey, come on, come on. My guys, come stay in my house. And then in the morning, get some breakfast and head on out. And the angels, heaven said, God said, uh, that's not going to happen. We're here to destroy this place. This is, this is fact and feeling. You know, a shadow and a substance, the difference between appearance and reality, the sensual and the spiritual. You know, things are not what they seem. C.M. Ward said that, if there's one thing you learn from Sodom, things are not what they seem to be. In the culture we live in, it's full of facades. It's full of all kinds of exterior stuff. It's full of all those things that are kind of out there. Visitors from heaven are walking toward us. I mean, we're, we're hearing words. We said before, during all of this, prophetic words have been on the rise. And I know we're wondering where all these things have come to pass and people are discounting everything. I know that in the midst of it, people miss it. It's working through a human vessel. But I can tell you that God's stirring in the hearts of people to say, it's time for a wake-up call. Lot did not get out of Sodom 
on his own. Abraham prayed for him. He interceded. He interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, he said, if there be 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, about 10. Are there 10 righteous people in the city? God's for the, for the sake of 10, I won't destroy it. I won't destroy it. There weren't even 10 righteous people in the Twin Cities. Not even 10. But there was Lot and his family. Angels. Think of those angels. All hands on deck. <laughs> they show up. Must have been a real interesting evening. Lot's thinking, hey, angels have shown up. These men seem like there's something different about them. I want to steer them away from the city streets. There's so much perversion going on in my town. I just got to do something. I'm going to persuade them to have dinner with me. And we're going to shut the door and we're going to hide everything that's out and about us. We'll hide all that stuff. And, and we'll make sure that they're happy and they go on their way. And basically, I can continue on life as usual. Well, here the men of those city, those perverts, got all excited and decided they were going to break in. Come into the... Hey, we want, we want those men that you brought into your house. What? What? I mean, just imagine it. If you were telling the story and you were lot, you're saying it, you wouldn't believe what happened. I thought I had it all sewed up. Everybody was in the house. We were enjoying our bread and doing everything. And then these men showed up, a whole bunch of them, aggressive. Yeah, they're loving. Uh-huh. Oh, they sure they are. I hear that all the time. Oh, we're very loving people, very caring people. Uh, not, not always the case. Very angry. Very aggressive. So, so the angels begin to speak, and then they've got to hasten Lot. Now, I want you just to visualize this for a little bit. They not only have to hasten Lot, but they have to hasten Lot's wife and Lot's daughters. And they can't seem to get it verbally, so they've got to take it to the next level. And they put their hands on each and every one of them. They reach out and they touch their hand. Now, I know we've just come through the, you know, pandemic and, you know, all the things going on and don't touch. But I can tell you, it was really something, if you think about it. I remember a number of years, well, it's not been a number of years, it's been a couple of years ago, we were out at mental health. And God gave me a word out of 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're cleansed, you're free. Paul was preaching all the social sins and said, those who do these things won't inherit the kingdom of God. And then I went back to Genesis 19, and I read that very scripture. And I walked down from where, well, I didn't walk down, I just walked over because we didn't have steps. And I walked over to the guy who was sitting in the front, right in the front. He was just like right here. And I said, God took him by the hand. I know Ed will shake my hand. He did on the way in. <laughs> he said he took him by the hand. And he pulled him out. What a merciful, loving, caring God. That he would come to one individual and his wife and his daughter and his daughter. And every one of them got a hand. Come on. You're going home. You're coming out of here. Be like going to the bar and pulling out a drunk and saying, hey, enough's enough. Let's go home. I remember that service vividly because I did just what I did with Ed for a man who was in that seat. Something. Afterwards, he came up to me and said, you know what? I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue your church and your denomination. He said... I am in this sin. I said, well, God's speaking to your heart because I didn't know a thing about you. I don't know anything about him to this day and I still don't know everything about you. But I can tell you what, God had a word for you. And I didn't plan on touching you or anybody else, but God just said, reach out, pull that man by the hand. People came down from MHI. We had a little powwow right there. I remember it. Totally remember it. Hadn't had a whole lot of people say, I'm going to sue you, your church, and your denomination. That was pretty intense. He said, you preached that out of that Bible. 
and you picked it, and you're responsible for it. I said, first and foremost, that's not my Bible. They have them here. <laughs> and I didn't write it. I'd love to have to take the credit, but I did. That's God's word. And, and I said, I'm not going to be afraid to tell the truth just because you don't want to hear it. And I said, I had nothing intentional for you. I have sinned. I'm on that list in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm one of those. Such were some of you. I was there. I told you I was there. We're just saying if you're there, there is an escape. And it comes through Jesus Christ. He's the Savior who can change you from the inside out. He can take you from where you are. And the, and the guy at MHI said, you be careful now how you speak. Because I also am in a particular lifestyle. I was like, I don't have to worry about how I speak. God's willing to save to the uttermost. He can save us no matter what sin has entangled us. Sin is sin, and sin is destructive, and God's willing not to let any to perish, but to take somebody by the hand. And you know to this day what I believe? That that man, though I don't know his name, he did, he did use some description for me. He said, you're pig-headed, you're ignorant. Now, what else did he say? <laughs> there were a number of things I kind of took him to heart, you know, and I thought, really? I thought it didn't feel, it didn't feel like I looked like that. But, but, <laughs> but you're ignorant, and, and you're going down. And I thought to myself, John the Baptist must have really been hurting in his day. <laughs> you know, he was not taming down things. But I believe that God had a word for that man that day that was so prevalent that he just came under the conviction so strong, and then it was reinforced by that handshake. He thought, God must be speaking to me through this person in that in that fish fights the hardest before it gets into the boat, maybe just fighting the hardest. And I believe that God touched him and he came to know him. Because by the way, he didn't get sued. And the church didn't get sued and the denomination didn't get sued because there wasn't anything in violation. They called each person who was in that service that day from mental health, all the clients, and asked them point blank how it all went down. And not one of them felt the same way he did. They just loved it. So, again, like, I don't, I don't know what to say. And even the people who were there that day that said, be careful, they started coming back too. So I'm here to tell you, the truth is truth, whether you like to hear it or not. But God is so merciful that he hands come out. Take me by the hand. I'm just going to read that scripture one last time here. And I want you just to let it sink into you like it sink into my heart. For, as we all know, he, Christ, that's Jesus we're talking about, did not take hold of angels, the fallen angels, to give them a helping and delivering hand. He didn't do that. But he did. But he did take hold of the fallen descendants. He, who is Christ, whoever lives, who's been in there in the beginning, he took hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham to reach out to them a helping and delivering hand. That's a powerful word. God's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. How about you today? Do you need a hand? God's reaching out. God's reaching in. He's reaching down. He's reaching over. He's coming into your court and saying, this is it. I'm here. And then maybe God wants to use me or you to be that hand extended. A helping hand and a delivering hand. Then they're done that. You can go there and you can be out. Whatever. You know, God help us. I want us to pray. Lord, you know every heart and every life of every person who's listening today and God who's here and saying, God, here am I. Use me. Last night in Sodom, oh, Lord, we're reminded of that scripture. Therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. God, Lot was hastened. He lingered, and the angels had to hasten him. Lord, it just needed a little, a little 
uh, encouragement, a little prodding, a little moving to, to get him off of that complacent place he was in. God, I pray today in the midst of revival that you would, God, hasten us, that you'd move us off center, off of our uh, indifference, off of, Lord, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. You said, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God's sin is still sin. The sin John the Baptist preached against is still the sin today. The sin, God, that Lord so easily besets us is still sin today. Lord, though the world we're living in may gloss over it, may somehow feel like they're empowered by it, God, it's still sin and we'll give an account. Lord, the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah's day rose up to heaven. Lord, that sin was so vile. And Lord, those cities had to be destroyed by fire, brimstone. People say, I want to hear a fire and brimstone preaching. God, we don't want to hear that in that sense of destruction. We want, Lord, God, for people to be saved. We want people to come out, Lord, to be delivered. God, we're thankful in the New Testament that Jesus died for our sin so that we may find life through him. We may be released and set free from all forms of addiction, all forms of perversion, all forms of sin and all of its sickness to it. God, we're God able to be delivered through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, you said, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, you've reached out your hand. Lord, you reached out your hand to me. Lord, we have gathered together. Lord, our hands, God, have been touched by the master's hand. Jesus, oh, he lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And love, with love, he lifted me. God, you're still lifting people today. And I pray today, Lord, that we'll sense and feel your hand lifting us. Lord, even hastening us. Lord, where we've become complacent or indifferent, where we've become lukewarm. Lord, where we've been settled in, in, in Sodom and somehow we need a little bit of, of prodding or we need a little tug from here. We need, Lord, the tug from the hand above to say it's time for us to move forward. It's time for us to get off of this place and, and begin to say, let those things be behind you. Let's press on to things that are before us. Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward those things which are before me. I'm pressing toward the prize and the mark of the high calling of God, and none of these things move me or keep me back. Lord, I pray, God, that we'll press on. Press on. This world's trying to bring us down. Lord, this world is full of lust, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Lord, how prideful Lord, many people have become. How prideful many churches have become. Lord, how prideful any of us can become. Lord, dependent upon our own reasoning. Lord, thinking somehow I've got this covered. I'm going to make it work. Lot even tried, Lord, with all kinds of little schemes and plans along the way to somehow cover, cover for the city. Somehow thinking maybe uh, my daughters will be safe because of their, their uh, perversion. Whatever. I don't know how his reasoning went, but God, it wasn't, it wasn't, divine reasoning. It wasn't divine word. It was human reasoning. And the angels heard from heaven. They knew. They were speaking forth truth. And God, I pray that we won't be deluded. We won't uh, somehow uh, be, uh, Lord, uh, deceived. But we'll hear your word. We'll hear your word with love and life and encouragement and say, wow, God loved me so. He saved me. He saved my wife. He saved my daughter's. Lot could say that, He'd, but his wife looked back. How hard that must have been. Lord, we think of Mrs. Lot. We think of Lot's wife. Left and moved into Sodom, and little by little, Sodom moved into her. Kids went to Sodom High, and she was part of the Sodom's YWCA or all those things. God, we, we can kind of visualize what it was like, God. Lot sat in the city gate, and Pretty soon was feeling pretty relaxed, and I kind of fit in here. God, we're not called to fit in. This world is not our home. We're moving on. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you stir us, not, Lord, to be odd, but, Lord, to be distinctively different. Jesus living big in and through us. The one who loves righteousness and hates iniquity. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd pour out of your spirit upon us today. Lord, we come hungering and thirsting. For more. John, if you and the worship team could come and 
We've been closing out with these worship uh, altar calls. And I really just feel in my heart God's stirring revival in our midst. And I don't say that without uh, a saying. I know that it's not based on a feeling. It's based on enough is enough. We're, we're not going to be complacent. Uh, it's time. We don't want to lose another generation. We don't want to lose our place. We don't want to somehow be silent. Yeah, I still pray for our government. I still pray for our government, all the uh, deception to be exposed. Uh, you know, I, I'm not here just to, you know, be silenced. Uh, we're here to speak. You know, it's funny how the world's saying, hey, you as a church got to be careful. Can't say this, can't say that. Really? And I'm glad somebody told me the truth. I was lost, you know. I mean, we, we could share testimony after testimony. Some things maybe we choose to share or not. But Paul wrote to the Corinthians believers and spoke to them. He said, I've got a whole list of social sins I'll enumerate here. And I'm sure he could have gone further. But he said, there are people here today who are all on that list. All of them. Fornicators, homosexuality, um, adulterers, uh, thieves, liars, swindlers. I mean, you, you go on and on, you know, dishonest Abe selling honest cars. You know, whatever. You, you, it can be for all of us. We've all sinned. I'm on that list. But through Jesus, I've been removed from that list. He said, but you, you've been washed, you've been cleansed. You're, you've been justified. You're you're just off that list because of what Jesus did. And that's great news. Because without that, where would we be? Where would we be? And then we get there, and Lot says, God says to Lot, Lot, get out of here. Yeah, I'll have to think about that here. Better send, get down there and grab by the hand. I don't know if his wife's coming either. Grab her by the hand. Daughters, I don't know where they're, son, they're not coming, so... They think it's just a joke. And out they go. And then Lot says, hey, you've been really merciful and gracious. I don't want to go where you want me to go. I want to go where I want to go. <laughs> it's a continual progressive work, isn't it? You would think that once we got out, we'd be real appreciative. But then we get complacent and we start thinking it's all about us. But this country club just doesn't suit me. I sure wish we had this, and I wish we had that. We're not here to be entertained. We're not here just to entertain one another. We're here to equip and empower, to go out into a world that's full of darkness, real, real darkness. But you have Jesus living big in and through you. So I pray that God will hasten us, hasten us. And if need be, like Abraham, we intercede. But like the angels, if we need to grab somebody by the hand and say, I'm serious about this, I'll do everything it'll take to bring you out. But you're coming out. Come on out. You're it. Could be you. So, Father, you know our hearts. I'd like for you to stand together with me this morning. If you're at home or wherever you are, just step up and get out of the chair or roll out of bed wherever you're at and begin to say, hey, I'm... I'm I got business to deal with God. God sees us. He knows where we're at. He knows everything about us. He knows everything that is going on. Though the devil may try to deceive us and trip us up, God is for us. And if God be for us, who could be against us? This world, if possible, will try to vex your soul. Lot's soul was vexed daily by the conversation or that word actually means the living the things he'd seen and the things he heard I don't know which gate is most uh, vulnerable for me I would say maybe the hearing gate but at times maybe it's the seeing gate we're in this world and we gotta let God guide us cleanse us but enable us to not let those things distract us because there's a mission.
And there are people who desperately need Jesus. So, Lord, we pray that you would hasten us like you did Lot. There's a hastening for the unbeliever, and there's a hastening for the believer. There's a hastening, God, for the person who, Lord, knows you, but just needs to be taken out of complacency or lingering, just lollygagging or loitering. Big word maybe years ago people used loitering, just hanging around for no reason at all. God, I pray that there be no loitering here. But God, there will be a move of your spirit. Move in me, God. Stir me up where I've been complacent, God. Let that happen in Jesus' name. I want you just to come to the altar. If you can't come to the altar, don't want to come to the altar, make an altar there in your pew. Let's close out. Crying out to God. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.
The devil would like to bring condemnation. You know, there's no judgment here. We're not judgmental people. Paul himself said, I am the chief of sinners. He recognized sin. The law of God made it exceedingly sinful. I remember praying for a gal. She came up to pray and she said, pray for me. I'm a sinner and a bad one. I said, yeah, so am I. Lest you think somehow that sin, and I don't want to give the impression that sin is just a sexual sin or a perversion. There's all kinds of sin. Probably the most prevalent sin in the church today is gossip. It is a sin. It's a sin. You know, sometimes people won't even preach on that. I'm amazed. I know you want to feel good when you hear a sermon. We want everybody to give us a motivational speak, a speech of something that will make us feel like we're equipped for a half hour. God wants to do something a little deeper. And he wants us to be convicted. The, the Holy Spirit convicts us so that we find a place of godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And say, you know, I have messed up. And I have been thinking, seeing saying, doing, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we, and it's, it affects our whole constitution. But the, the, the key here is, let's, we're not living just in Sodom. Sodom wants to live in us. And if you've never had that struggle, I would be amazed. Because that's what the New Testament's all about get inside them out of us. We're, we're not inside them. But boy, it sure seems like we're getting close to it again. But God help us to be spirit living, led by the spirit. But I love, I love this chorus John is singing here because John and I, we didn't confer. We didn't talk about what he's leading. But he says, turn my heart, O Lord, by your hand. Think of God reaching down with his hand and turning your heart. Johnny, you want to just close us out with that and lead us in a closing prayer? Hallelujah. Turn my heart, oh Lord, like rivers of water. Turn my heart, O Lord, by your hand, till my whole life blows 
one here, Lord God. I pray that you'd empower and energize them with the touch of your hand, Lord God, to lead, to guide, to, to lead out of uh, wherever it needs leading out of and into, Lord God, your presence and into the lives of others. God, may we grab others, Lord God, by the hand and lead them, uh, lead them out, Lord God. Thank you for divine revelation and divine contacts this week, Lord God, to touch and grab by the hand and say, this is the way that God would have you go. Bless each one now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning. Amen. Lord, I surrender.